and welcome back to part six of nursing care of the newborn and the family. We are almost done. Stay with me, people. We're going to get through this. Again, I just want to remind you again of what your goals of newborn nursing care are. To And the first one is to promote physical well-being of the newborn. So you're going to assess them, examine them, make sure that they are physically well before you discharge them. And two, to uh, support the establishment of a well-functioning family unit. Uh, there, are going to, there are going to be times in your nursing career when you are not going to always agree uh, with a particular family unit. Uh, you may have your own personal biases against something. You may have safety concerns for the infant. But as long as you have documented everything and you have made appropriate uh, referrals to Children's Division, if they deem that a baby is safe to go home, it is your job to prepare that family um, as the very best that you can. So you're going to do a lot of discharge teaching. You want to make sure that appointments are made, that uh, ref all the appropriate follow-up referrals are um, you know, set up. Send them home with whatever supplies that you think they need. Um, and again, your job is to get that baby and that family off to the very best possible start possible. Some common birth injuries that occur um, with birth would be sub, uh, subconjunctival hemorrhages. Um, these are like little scleral hemorrhages um, that can happen. Sometimes in the whites of baby's eyes, they'll have, you know, red, you know, busted blood vessels. Um, any type of, you know, little tiny micro hemorrhages like this, these usually heal within about five days. They are harmless usually. Um, Obviously, we know that babies get head abrasions. They can have head edema, molding, bruising, forcep marks. If you look at the p picture here, uh, this baby has a has forcep marks on his or her little cheek. Um, but generally, the harder the delivery was, the more beat up a baby is going to look afterwards. Uh, it's common for babies to have bruised faces, especially if the baby was born sunny side up or face up, as opposed to uh, looking down at the floor. Um, other lacerations or bruising, um, sometimes babies can have cuts from the scalpels, uh, from the scalpel that is used during the C-section. These tiny cuts are commonly found on the scalp, on the buttocks, or on the thighs. They are superficial, they only need to be kept clean. Rarely would you have to apply a Steri-Strip, but that would be about it. Um, we've talked about fractured clavicles already, and then again, jaundice before 24 hours of age. Again, the management of jaundice, feed, feed, feed. Seriously, that's it. That is the one of the best treatments for jaundice. Because if the food goes in, then the pee and the poop are going to come out. That's how bilirubin is excreted. It is excreted through the poop. The more you feed them, the more they poop, the faster the bilirubin comes down. The tricky part is jaundice babies are sleepy and they don't want to eat. And that is very unfortunate. <laughs> so you really almost have to just stick with the schedule about every two hours and get them to eat as much as possible. You can actually get more food in them if you feed them every two hours and go smaller meals than if you fed them every three to four hours and gave them bigger meals. It's better to feed close, smaller feeds because again, when babies are jaundiced, they're sleepy. They're poor feeders. They don't, they don't care about eating. And that's the one thing that will help them. Um, if a baby's uh, billy level gets too high, the babies uh, will receive phototherapy like the uh, baby has, in, has going in the picture. One of the key things is with phototherapy is to make sure that you pr uh, apply the protective eye shields and take those off with feeds. I've seen nurses before who just leave the little eye shields on in place and then try and feed a baby. I'm sorry, this baby has not been kidnapped. There's no reason why the baby has to be blindfolded and you know, be expected to eat. That's just creepy and weird. So take their eye shields off and let them look around. Let give their eyes a little bit of a break, especially while they feed. Let them interact and have some human interaction. Uh, as far as phototherapy goes, they make Billy beds, Billy blankets, and Billy lights. Uh, the Neo Blue are the best ones. That's what this baby has going in here. Um, and then if Billy levels get to a critical high, they can do what's called a blood exchange transfusion. So, 
And people always ask me, I can't tell you how many times I've been asked this as a baby nurse, no, Billy lights are not the same thing as a tanning bed. We don't need to put sunscreen on the baby. This is not a tanning bed. They're not going to turn tan because of this. Um, Billy blankets, in my opinion, are pretty worthless. Um, they don't really seem to do a lot. Maybe for, I don't know. I Again, I don't see the Billy levels come down a whole lot with just a Billy blanket. The best by far are the uh, high intensity neo blue lights. Some of the labs and diagnostic tests that have to be completed prior to discharge include the Missouri Newborn Screen, also what a lot of nurses call the PKU test, and a serum Billy test, a newborn hearing screen, and a pre and post ductal pulse ox check. The newborn screening is ideally done 24 hours after the first feed. That is not the same thing as 24 hours from the time of birth. If the baby, you really have to look back and see what time that baby had the first feed. And ideally, you really need that done at least 24 to 36 hours after the first feed. Um, then at the, usually at the same time when the nurse draws the, the PKU or the Missouri Newborn Screening Test, then she also, or he, can also draw the Billy test at the same time. I already talked before about what the Missouri Newborn Screen tests for. Um, blood is collected from babies via a heel stick. Occasionally, if a lot of blood is needed, or if you need to draw blood for a blood culture, you can do an arterial stick in the wrist. Venipuncture in babies does not work very well because they have such low blood pressure. So it's kind of a tricky thing to do. If babies fail the hearing screen, like their initial one, then the tech will normally redo the test again before discharge and if they fail a second time, then they follow up as an outpatient with the audiology clinic. Sometimes babies fail because they, because they just have birth goo and fluid in their ears. So try to reassure parents that it is a screen, not a diagnostic test. Uh, the hearing screens are not diagnostic of a hearing deficit. We're just screening at this point. The pre and pulse ox, uh, pul uh, the pre and post ductal pulse ox check, goodness sakes, I couldn't get that out, is there to make sure that there's no significance, uh, no significant difference in the numbers. If there is a big difference in the pre and post ductal pulse ox, then it can be indicative of a cardiac problem. Do babies feel pain? I don't know. Yes, they absolutely do. I've had people ask me this question before too. Um, well, they're a baby, they don't feel pain. Why in the world would they not feel pain? I can tell you with 100% certainty, babies feel pain. And as far as pain management goes, in babies, your best bet is to treat the cause. If the cause why they're screaming and they are hurting is a dirty diaper, change it. Swaddle babies, rock them, feed them. All of those things work wonders to soothe a fussy baby. Um, another thing that you can do um, is we give babies sucrose, um, sucrose and sucking it's called, <laughs> but we give them, um, I think it's a 20% sucrose, but we, get, we put sucrose either um, in their mouth and let them suck on a pacifier or put a little bit of sucrose um, in a bottle nipple and just let them suck on that. It works very, very well. And they can also take Tylenol and narcotic wise, babies can have morphine and fentanyl. There are also local anesthetics and topical anesthetics that can be used too. Usually where we really worry about pain management in babies um, would be our NICU babies who are post-op and they're going to be the ones getting the morphine and the fentanyl. Um, we can also sedate them with Nebutal, but that doesn't do anything for their pain. So we always, we always have to treat the pain too. Um, and then the other time that babies really get, you know, we actually worry about treating their pain is uh, for a circumcision. And so usually um, around here, most pediatricians will put a, they will do a local block for the circumcision. Um, but prior to that, because, you know, you are injecting the penis, um, that we will give babies some sucrose and they will suck on the sucrose. Um, they usually fuss a little bit during the um, actual numbing process. But then, you know, you know that the local has, the local anesthetic has taken effect because most of the time babies will sleep right through the circumcision as long as the pediatrician waits long enough for the anesthetic to actually kick in.
So speaking of circumcision care, let's talk about that for a minute. The three most common methods would be Gomco, Plastibel, and Sheldon clamp. Now before we get to that, you should know that if a baby has a hypo or an epispadius, they are not eligible for circumcision because the urologist will need that foreskin for the repair. Your job as the RN is to verify that the consent has been signed, prep the baby, pull medications such as lidocaine, Tylenol, and sucrose from the Omnicell. You will administer medicines as needed and you will assist the physician with the process as needed. Usually what that entails is keeping the baby positioned um, and keeping the baby quiet. So you're usually the one who is um, standing on the other side of the baby or just standing off to the side of the baby, making sure that they have their pacifier and that they are calm during the procedure. The other big thing that nurses do is teach parents about post-circ care. And I reference page 617 in your textbook that you should look at. With the Plastibel, it's kind of nice because once the Plastibel is applied um, and they tie the um, suture around the actual circumcision, <clears throat> there's really no special care that's needed. Um, the Plastibel falls off in about eight days and then after that the circumcision is healed. With a Sheldon and a Gomco, what usually happens is that the order is to apply either Vaseline or Neosporin to a piece of gauze and that goes directly over top of the exposed glands of the penis for the first, for, like every diaper change, for the first 24 hours. And then after that, usually they, um, the, the directions are to apply either Neosporin or Vaseline to the actual penis itself, every diaper change uh, for the first week until the circumcision heals. And the reason we do that is because we wanna keep the penis greased up so that nothing will stick to it because you would hate for, um, for, the, for the penis to scab over and stick to the diaper and then to rip the diaper open and rip the circumcision open when the parents go home. Um, for, to care for a baby who has not been circumcised, and we see our fair share of those as well, no special care is needed. Um, always make sure you teach parents that they do not need to worry about retracting foreskin just to keep the penis clean with the soapy water from a bath. As far as parent teaching goes, um, it's important to assess your family before you go in there to do your teaching. Um, you need to assess, is this mom's first baby and she was going to have a lot of questions? Or is this mom's fifth child and she has been there and done this and she can probably school you on a few things, tips on discharge teaching. Either way, it's important to involve the family early in the care of the infant. Um, and then you teach parents about feeding cues, their alert state, which would be like when to feed them, when to let them sleep, things like that. Teach them about cord care, safe sleeping, how to check a temperature, um, and when to call the pediatrician. And this slide just outlines more um, topics that are necessary uh, for nurses to go over in discharge teaching for newborns. And this slide just goes over even more discharge teaching. Who knew it was so complicated? And people who say that babies don't come with instructions did not have their babies in a hospital because when you birth a baby in a hospital, you get instructions on exactly how to take care of that baby when you go home. Um, as far as car seat safety goes, it seems crazy that you have to tell parents this, but of course they have to ride rear facing in a car seat, in the back seat. Um, and please stress to them to never leave their baby alone in a car. It just breaks my heart every time I see stories on the news about people who've gone off and left their baby in a car. Um, so that's why they make pay at the pump and it's a pain to haul your baby in the grocery store when they're asleep to go pick up a loaf of bread. I get it, but it's going to be even worse if something happened to that baby too. So you just have to stress that to parents. Shaken baby syndrome also breaks my heart every time I uh, hear a case about this on the news. It is very important to warn parents about the danger. Uh, parents need to know they need to make a plan about who they will call and what they will do when the crying gets on their last nerve, because it will. I don't believe that anybody sets out to intentionally kill or murder a baby, but after months of being sleep deprived or stressed or people just needing five minutes of silence, 
And then on top of that, being so frustrated and feeling so hopeless about not thinking you have the skills or not knowing if you have the skills to make the baby stop crying, people lash out and shake. It's interesting, it's not usually the parents who shake the baby. Um, if you look at actual documented court cases, it's usually the babysitter, and we've seen a lot of cases like that around lately. Um, or historically, it's going to be mom's boyfriend. I'm not trying to be judgmental and pick on anybody. Um, I'm not trying to pick on single moms or single dads. I'm just simply looking at the facts. That being said, it is always important to counsel parents to be very careful and very choosy about who they leave their baby with, especially our young single teenage moms. I always give them extra education about this. If all else fails, put the baby in the crib and walk away and then call for some help. This concludes part six or chapter 23 of your textbook.